Our first lesson comes from the book of Proverbs, the 8th chapter, verses 1 through 4 and 22 through 31. Doesn't wisdom call out? Doesn't understanding raise her voice? At the highest point along the way, she takes her place where the paths meet. Beside the gate leading into the city, she cries out at the entrance. She says, People, I call out to you. I raise my voice to all human beings. The Lord created me as the first of his works before his acts of long ago. I was formed a long, long time ago. I was formed at the very beginning when the world was created. Before there were any oceans, I was born. It was before there were springs flowing with water. Before the mountains were settled in place, I was born. Before there were any hills, I was born. It happened before the Lord made the world and its fields. It was before he made the dust of the earth. I was there when he set the heavens in place, when he marked out the place where the sky meets the sea. I was there. That was when he put the clouds above. It was when he fixed the ocean springs in place. It was when he set limits for the sea so that the waters had to obey his command. When the Lord marked out the foundations of the earth, I was there. I was constantly at his side. I was filled with delight day after day. I was always happy to be with him. His whole world filled me with joy. I took delight in all human beings. Here ends our first lesson. Our second lesson comes from the book of Romans, the fifth chapter, verses 1 through 5. We have been made right with God because of our faith. Now we have peace with him because of our Lord Jesus Christ. Through faith in Jesus, we have received God's grace. In that grace, we stand. We are full of joy because we expect to share in God's glory. And that is not all. We are full of joy even when we suffer. We know that our suffering gives us the strength to go on. The strength to go on produces character character produces hope, and hope will never bring us shame. That's because God's love has been poured into our hearts. This happened through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. Here ends our second lesson. Our gospel lesson is according to St. John, the 16th chapter, verses 12 through 15. Jesus said, I have much more to say to you. It is more than you can handle right now. But when the Spirit of Truth comes, she will guide you into all the truth. She will not speak on her own. She will speak only what she hears, and she will tell you what is still going to happen. She will bring me glory. That's because what she receives from me, she will show to you. Everything that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said, what the Holy Spirit receives from me, she will show also to you. The Gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Greetings, sisters and brothers in Christ. The title of our message for this Trinity weekend um, is Holy Trinity, God of Relationships. Let us pray. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Thank you.
So excuse our, um, the bare background here. I'm not filming this in the church. I'm filming it in my hotel room in Worcester, Massachusetts. I'm here with over 400 other Lutherans gathered here Thursday, Friday, and Saturday of this week for something called the New England Synod Assembly. We do this every June. Um, it's a gathering of church, the community of faith, the wider church. Every church sends pastor and two people um, to, we worship, we learn, we have conversation together about some challenging uh, topics, um, issues of justice um, that, that we're uh, struggling to bring about in our world today. Um, and we together make decisions and policies as to how we're going to address these things. So we've been talking about climate change and we've been talking a lot about anti-racism. And, um, and my hope is that, um, that these conversations can be as fruitful this year um, as they were in the past. Um, about 15 years ago, I came here with um, two people from my congregation and we got into a big conversation about the Trinity, a topic for this weekend. And people were arguing and debating and someone said, does anyone even know what the Trinity means anymore? We should just get rid of it. We don't, we don't, we don't even, do we really believe it? And uh, it got very heated. And so the, the, the end result was that everyone was to go back into their congregations and spend a year studying the Trinity, and then we'd reconvene and come up with, okay, what do we believe about the Trinity? Well, of course, um, often what it means when we table something like that is nothing's ever done about it, right? It just gets forgotten. But our little trio, our little Trinity who had come here 15 years ago, we went back and we ordered books and we got the theology professor, Dr. Hoffmeyer from the Lutheran Seminary to recommend what we should study. And we watched movies and we had conversations. And we really got into the Trinity to the point where um, when I got my doctorate a few years later, I did this 45 page paper on the Holy Trinity and you know, shared that with the congregation and we were on fire with the Trinity. And yet after all that, if I had to sum it up in a nutshell, what I would say is what we learned together is that the Trinity is all about relationships that we have a God who even within God's own being and nature is relational and exists in relationship, right? So we speak of God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But think about that. You cannot be a father without having children. That's a relational word. You cannot be a son without having parents. That too is a relational word. Um, and the Holy Spirit, uh, we watched a film just two weeks ago actually, where we learned about, someone spoke of the Holy Spirit as that um, interconnecting energy that exists in relationship that connects us. Um, that love, we talk about God as love, that energetic connection of God's love that connects us in relationship. And that it's through relationship that we experience this God who is love. So sisters and brothers, on this Trinity weekend, I'd like us to think about God 
who is relational and who invites us um, to experience God's self through our relationships, specifically our relationship with God, our relationships with others, and even our relationship with ourselves. And this goes along very much, right, with Jesus when he was asked to sum up the whole teaching of the Torah, right, the whole word of God for him as a, as a Jewish rabbi, they said, what is the meaning of all the law, the Torah and the prophets? And he said, he took a verse from Deuteronomy and a verse from Leviticus and he put them together to come out with his greatest commandment. He said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And you shall love others your neighbor, right, as you love yourself. So for just a few minutes, let's look at those three dimensions, a trinity of relationships, our relationship with God, our relationships with others, and our relationships with ourselves and how are they, they are all part of our coming to a deeper understanding of this Trinitarian relational God. So let's start with our relationship with God. Um, we heard a presentation this afternoon from three campus ministers and I heard a statistic I found very um, alarming and, and it was uh, one of the chaplains said that on college campuses, 40% of college students say they are of no faith and I identify as having no faith and being either atheist or agnostic. 40% of college students. Um, now, the, uh, as a person of faith, and that was disturbing to me. I hope it's disturbing to you. But I know in my own work with college students, I've been on the adjunct faculty of a university for the past seven years, what I hear from these folks who identify as agnostic or atheist is that they see in people of faith such hatefulness and judgment and condemnation that they want no part of that. And so that leads us to the question of, in our relationship with God, right? Um, how are we living that out in our lives? Are, are we living that out in our lives in such a way that they see in our lives this God of love, this God of relationship? who's reaching out and longing relationship, uh, love for to be in relationship with us, or when people see our lives, are they seeing judgment and condemnation and hatefulness? Ooh, that would turn me right off as well. So how can we nurture our own relationship, open ourselves more deeply to be in relationship with this God of love so that we can live that more fully in our human relationships. So um, this coming fall, I'm teaching a course, a new course they asked me to develop called The Spiritual Quest. And it's specifically for people who say they have no faith or religion, but are, um, are looking into it, are considering it. And so that's why it's called the spiritual quest. And so it's kind of fun, but also challenging to say, okay, how to open folks who have no faith, that 40%, to that spiritual dimension of life? What's, what's a way in to that? And so I'm using um, a multifaceted approach, but what I've heard from young people 
is that they do experience that spiritual dimension of life in um, three ways. And the first way is through nature. The Bible itself is filled, the book of Psalms is all about experiencing God, this relational God, through nature, through the beauty and majesty of God's creation, right? And that beauty and majesty and interconnectedness, that mystery and miracle of nature. So that's one way in, if you will, right? Um, and that leads us also to beauty. The beauty of nature leads us to other kinds of beauty. And specifically, I think of the arts. I think of the beauty of music, which can touch our souls, even for people who have n want nothing to do with God or religion, they can be deeply moved to that more expansive dimension of life through music, through the visual arts, through dance, through theater, through poetry, through writing, okay? So nature, beauty, the arts, um, but also through service through um, feeling that you are helping um, to bring about a, some better state for something you feel passionately about. So say you feel passionately about protecting our earth and helping our environment. When you're doing that work of service to help the earth, to help the environment, and you're working besides others who share that, that passion and that commitment, that community of, of, of service for something bigger, for a bigger cause, opens us to that more expansive dimension of life that those of us of the 60% of people of faith would call God. Um, and so it might be a, a social justice group an anti-racism group, an environmental group. It may be a 12-step um, a group, but something that connects you with others and helping others and helping some to um, alleviate some suffering and bring about some justice for something that you feel passionately about. That is another way we experience this God of relationship. So that moves us into not just God, right, but our human relationships. So loving God, we're going to tend to our spiritual relationship by experiencing um, nature more, by by participating in, in some form of service. Oh, and the third thing I forgot to mention was a spiritual practice. Those of us who are people of faith might call it prayer. Non-faith people might call it meditation. Um, uh, reading our sacred text, meditating with scripture, um, people of non-faith might read poetry about the earth and, and that would be a sacred text to them. So um, prayer, meditation, um, meditation of a text, meditation of art, um, all uh, worship. For us, uh, people of faith, we call it worship. But um, for people who are, are not people of faith, that might take the form of tending to our personal relationships and community. So these are all ways we can tend to our relationship with God in these ways. So we've, we've already gone into now the second level of um, loving God and loving others.
and experiencing this Trinitarian God of relationship through our love of God as we live that out in our relationships with others. Um, isn't it ironic that our deepest relationships in our lives, the ones that give us the most joy and fulfillment and deep happiness also bring about the deepest pain and suffering. The Buddhist monk Thich Nhat Hanh says that every human being experiences deep suffering in their lives and deep love and that they always go together. Um, why is that? Why would this God of love um, give us the, the gift of human relationships that only end up causing us such deep suffering? Well, the uh, Lutheran theologian and pastor and martyr, uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer said in his little book, Life Together, that it's these most difficult aspects of our human relationships, it's these, the deepest challenges that he says are given to us to expand us, to crack us open, to widen us and expand us to experience more of this God who is love. And so I hope again that this difficult conversation we had here today at our Senate Assembly about anti-racism, um, because of our love for each other as sisters and brothers and because of our passion for this issue of, of justice, of anti-racism. I hope that it can expand all of us to grow, to love our sisters and brothers more deeply. Um, uh, then, when we, it, you know, that to me reminds me of cross and resurrection, right? In our personal relationships, we have this suffering, we have this pain, but if we can hang in there and stay in these relationships that challenge us, and I'm not talking about relationships that abuse us, but I'm talking about relationships that challenge us, challenge us and, 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 and help us to crack open and expand. If we can hang in there in those relationships, if we can go through the cross, then we get to a place of resurrection and new life. And that's what true agape, God-like love, God who is love, is all about. And then finally, sisters and brothers, the, the last part of this great commandment is we are to love God with our whole being. We are to love others as we love ourselves. For most people I know, it's loving ourselves that is actually the most difficult. And we cannot truly love others, and maybe that's part of that judgmental, condemning, hateful speech, because when folks speak that way, they, they don't love themselves. Um, from the very first chapter of the very first book of our Bible, the book of Genesis, we're told that every human being was created by God in God's own image and likeness. That Imago Dei is at the heart of each of us as human beings. And so yes, we're challenged to see that image of God in all we encounter, but sisters and brothers were also challenged to see that image of God within ourselves. And as I've said, sometimes that is the most difficult place to see God's presence. Martin Luther helps us out a bit. And he says, don't worry, you don't have to be perfect to love yourself. 
he, he one of his teachings I most love is how he says we are all simul justus et peccator. We are all simultaneously saints and sinners. Okay, we don't um, we don't like that sinful part of ourselves. Um, but I don't know about you when I read the lives of the saints. The ones who are so perfect, I don't know, I just can't, they don't do much for me. Why? Because I can, I can never be that. But when I read about the flaws of the saints, you know, their, their brokenness, their, their short-sightedness, their, you know, whatever it might be, that's what gives me hope. That's what gives me hope because that I can be. I can be a, a saint um, uh, who is very flawed, very flawed. And so, sisters and brothers, this day, this Trinity weekend, we are invited to think about a God, our God, who is a God of relationship, a God who is love, and love by its very nature is relational. And this God who is love so much that this God um, exists in relationship even within God's own being. God the Father to the Son and to wisdom from our first reading, Chokma, Sophia, she and God as this, as this partnership. God in relationship within God's very being and interconnected by that energy, that spirit of love. And then may we who've experienced this God of love, this relational God, live that out in our relationships with others and even in our relationship with ourselves so that others may feel invited in and embraced in that God who is love. Amen. And now may God bless us and keep us. May God's face shine upon us and be gracious unto us. May God look upon us with blessing and grant us peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve God and the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen.